Well, hello friends and welcome to Ask Zach. Today we're gonna to spotlight probably the, I guess one of the Telecaster's best friends and that is Mr. Red Volkart. I'm a, a huge fan and proud to say a, a friend of, of Red and I love his playing. And a couple episodes ago I did, uh, did one on the, the ashtray cover on Telecasters and at the end of the video I played uh, you know, my little rendition of Red Wing and somebody complimented me and they said, uh, you sound like Red Volkart on there. And <laughs> that was just, I was floored by that. And then I, I just started thinking about how much uh, I've relied on Red through the years for, for input and inspiration and just how important he is as a, as a Telecaster player and as a torch bearer of the real pure Telecaster sound. So today's episode is on Red Volkart. We're gonna have a new segment at the end. It's gonna be Zach's book time. So in a couple of the live streams, I've had people say, you have got to talk about all those books that you have on your shelves. And yes, I've, I've read them all. And they're all, you know, of course, music-oriented uh, biographies or historical pieces on instruments and such. And so I'm going to start focusing on uh, the, the best of, of my library here. And I'm going to talk about them and, and recommend some books. So that'll be at the end. All right. So while you're thinking about it, if you've been enjoying the show then, uh, and you haven't done it already, please go down in the, in the corner and hit subscribe. If you've already done that, then I really appreciate you supporting the show. The best way is Patreon, and there's links down in the description. Also, there's good old tip jar information, or uh, you can go to askzack.com and you can find things like this uh, amp schematic shirt and other, uh, other, you know, coffee cups and all sorts of stuff. So I really appreciate those of you that have supported me. All right, so let's dive in. So... Justin Red Volkart was born March 6th, 1958 in Vancouver, British Columbia. He started playing the guitar at age 10 and was initially influenced by a lot of the rock guys of the time. Again, this would be about 1968. So there was uh, Albert King and Deep Purple and of course there was kind of blues rock and the British rock kind of coming in. But then he heard Buck Owens and Merle Haggard and Roy Nichols, and he came under the spell. And so he got a uh, 58 Esquire that he uh, chiseled out and put a Charlie Christian pickup in it and, uh, and started his, uh, his journey as one of the great, uh, you know, I guess modern Telecaster players. He, uh, he played around Canada and then uh, spent some time in both Texas and California in Los Angeles, playing a lot of a lot of live gigs before he moved to Nashville, and it's Nashville where he, uh, you know, really started becoming uh, noted, especially through his playing with the Don Kelly Band. So he had at least two different stints with the Don Kelly Band, and was just extremely inf influential. Now, if you need to learn more about Don Kelly, I've done an interview with him uh, that. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll put a link in the description also. Uh, Don Kelly was one of the most important band leaders in Nashville, and he always had a top flight band, including a top flight Telecaster player and other guys that of course went through his band include guys like Brent Mason and uh, Daniel Donato and Johnny Highland and J.D. Simon, Guthrie Trapp, and on and on and on. So Red, was in Don Kelly's band in, uh, in a, apparently in part of the 80s and also into the 1990s. And during that time, he, 
he got the call from Merle Haggard himself to uh, to be the you know the lead guitarist in Merle's band, The Strangers, and he's said you know in interviews, including the interview I did with him, that uh, that he thought it was a joke, and uh, and he uh, <laughs> he used some profanity in talking to Merle Haggard before he realized that it was uh, that it was Merle. And so this is kind of where I and a lot of other people found out about Red. So once he started playing with, with Merle Haggard, he was on a, on a big stage and appearing on television and being in shows everywhere. And he even uh, put out a, a solo record uh, that I have here called uh, Telewhacker. And so this was released in 1998. And the album... Uh, you know, garnered him some uh, some notice from the guitar magazines, and I remember uh, vividly seeing the article in Guitar Player magazine that showed a picture of Red holding a bunch of Telecasters and Merle Haggard records, and then talking about his album and also the fact that he was working with Merle. Well, I found out that Merle was playing in Corpus Christi, Texas, and so my buddy Bobby Lawson and I. Uh, we went and saw Merle, and so I still have the ticket. So this was Huerta Concerts Presents Merle Haggard and David Allen Co. Friday, September 4th, 1998 at 8 p.m. at the Texas Sky Park, which was kind of an outdoor, you know, concrete little uh, park. And uh, yeah, I was so excited to see Merle and Red. And one of the reasons was that, of course, you know, growing up in the 80s and 90s, when I saw Merle Haggard on television, the guitarist that was with him most of the time in these performances was Clint Strong. Now, I love Clint Strong's playing, and Clint Strong is a fabulous player. He is a bebop player, and he would usually play a wine red Les Paul Custom through a PV Session 400 amplifier and played many times on the neck pickup, played really clean, played with the little jazz picks. Incredible bebop player, so clean, so fast, uh, a wonderful player. But he was really not, not like Roy Nichols in any way, shape, or form. Um, he fit with the band well and played fantastic. However, I wanted to hear that James Burton, Roy Nichols, Telecaster thing, and just that vibe so the chance to see Merle Haggard, Merle Haggard with Red Volkart was to me just the ultimate. It was it was you know as close as you could get to seeing uh, James Burton or uh, or Roy Nichols playing with them. So we went to the show and I was looking on the stage and I could see that Merle had two you know four ten tweed basements. And Red Volkart had two dual professional amps. So if you don't remember the dual professional, it was a custom shop like hand wired amp that was, you know, looked like a twin reverb, except it had blonde covering and it had like a fat switch. And uh, and I think that he either had EVs or, uh, or JBLs in the amps, but he had two of them. They were both tilted back and Merle and Red came out and, uh, I have to say, David Allen Coe opened the show, and he he was good. But I was it didn't matter how good David Allen Coe was. I couldn't wait to see you know Red and Merle. So Merle and Red come out, and they're both playing Merle's signature model guitars that Fender had just started making, and they were these neck through guitars that were based on instruments that Jerry Jones, the guitar builder that made all those upgraded Dan Electro type guitars, had made for Merle back in the '80s, and they were neck through because that allowed him to do hollowed out sides and that way he could make the instrument as light as possible and still be, you know, strong structurally. So, uh, so and, and Fender made a variation of that when they started making a signature model, but because of course, Jerry Jones was not in, he did not want to make that guitar over and over again. And, uh, you know, and, and Fender did. So that, that's what they, that's what happened. So on their guitars, the one modification that was, you know, very easy to tell even from the audience was that both of them had changed their pickups. So both Merle and Red had single blade pickups on there. 
And at the time, I didn't know what they were. But then, of course, later on, I found out that uh, Red had gotten some Jake Jones pickups that, uh, in fact, initially, he had really liked the original version of the Joe Barden pickup that was a single coil. It had a single blade. And, but it was short-lived. And so there are shots of Danny Gatton playing the single blade uh, Barden pickups, but uh, they of course changed it and made it humbucking. And uh, somehow Red had a set of those pickups that he put in his guitar and uh, Merle wanted them. And, and uh, so he was able to get Jake Jones to make kind of copies of that original Joe Barden design because Joe Barden would not do it because he felt like the humbucking was a, a, a better design. So they played fantastic, and it was just amazing to hear those songs because Merle was still in fantastic voice, and Red was playing all those licks in the way they were supposed to be played. And it wasn't like he, you know, mimicked note for note what James Burton and, and Roy Nichols did, but he uh, he played in that spirit, in that vein, and that's what I had wanted to see. That's what I was missing with Clint Strong, and, and again. Total respect for Clint Strong as a player. But Red, it was it was just the perfect fit. Merle and Red. It was a fantastic show and one that uh, will always be a, a sweet a sweet memory and uh, one of the best shows I've ever seen. So fast forward a couple of years and I started working for Brad Paisley. And we were going to Austin and to do a show and... I was, of course, I was Brad's guitar tech at this point. And Brad told me, he said, now we're going to have somebody sit in. It's Red Volkart. And of course, I was very excited. And, and I said, so is he going to play at the end of the show? And Brad said, no, he's going to play the whole show. Now, that was very unusual because Brad would have guests come on, but usually it was at the end of the show. And they would do like a song or two. But he was going to have Red come out with the band and play the entire show. So Red shows up and he's got, you know, he's got his Telecaster and a gig bag and he's got this tweed looking amp. And as I get closer, I can tell it's a, it's a high powered tweed twin. And uh, I offer, Hey, can I, can I help you with your amp? And he very, <laughs> he smiles and says, sure. And then I found out why he said that. It was because the amp weighed about 100 pounds. It had an EVM 12L and a JBL D120F. So right there, that's 35 pounds just in the speakers. Okay, so because that EV is about 20 pounds, the you know the JBL is about 15. So you've got 35 pounds of speaker. Then you take the amp itself. So the amp was actually a. Uh, it was built by Eric Borash kind of, he's more known as Ebo here in town and he makes amps and digital, I mean, not digital, he makes a really cool uh, spring reverb units and uh, great builder, great guy, great guitarist. Um, so I carried that amp and thought I was gonna, you know, slip a disc or something, but I, I got his Tweed Twin set up and he had a small pedal board. He had one of those little BCB3s. That's the, the little gray plastic pedal board that Boss made, but it only fit three pedals. On it, he had a CS2, the blue compressor pedal with three knobs. He had the DM3 analog delay, and he had a, uh, a blues driver, a BD2, unmodified, you know, just normal. And then he had a, some type of little Korg tuner that was just kind of wired in there up top. And that's all he had. Telly, those, you know, three pedals, a tuner, and a, a tweed, a high-powered tweed twin with an EV and a JBL. And every single song, Brad gave him a solo, and he played amazing. And of course, it was a hometown crowd, because by this point, you know, Red had lived in Nashville, but he had he had moved to, uh, to Austin, actually during the time he was playing with Merle. And uh, so he was kind of a hometown favorite, and so the audience, of course, really ate it up that uh, Brad had read and Red played fantastic. Fast forward a year or two, I'm still working for Brad and we start recording the, the Mud on the Tires album. And he decides he wants to do an instrumental with, uh, with Red. And so he has Red flown in from Austin and he comes up and he's got that same little pedal board and uh, we had a, a rental amp. I think we had a Drip Edge uh, 68 uh, Super Reverb for him. And at this time, he had a no caster that was sunburst. And I think it was one of those. Red 
just finds all the cool Telecasters. I mean, he always has a cool Tele. I mean, and this one was something where it was like refinished by the Fender factory later on. So it was Sunburst, White Pit Guard, No Caster. And uh, he played fantastic in the studio. And I really enjoyed it because I, I got to see him record. And then also uh, I was kind of his uh, chauffeur. So I, uh, I got to take him back to the, uh, to the hotel he was staying at and I got to talk to him. And you know, of course we went, to, we went to dinner and ate Mexican food together and, and such. And it was just really fun to hang out with him and Brad and, and just hear them you know, tell stories. And during that I found out that unbeknownst to me, Brad had been a big fan of Red for a long time. And that back in the 90s, that uh, Brad would go and see Red Volkart play with Don Kelly down at, at Roberts, uh, downtown Nashville. So yeah, it was, it was a really uh, special and fun time. And then fast forward just a couple more months and Brad Paisley got married to his wife, Kim. And they had a wedding reception on the beach in Malibu, California. And under a big old tent was Red Volkart and his trio. And they, they flew him in, and they, yeah, he had his bass player and his drummer with him, and they had rental amps, they had twin reverbs. And it was a uh, kind of a, a big kind of Hollywood kind of deal. There were record execs from Nashville, and there were actors. Of course, Brad's wife is, is an actress, and uh, so there were a lot of actors there and Hollywood types. And I really didn't know anyone besides, uh, you know, Red, and Brad, and uh, and so I really didn't know what to do. And then finally, I, I just you know, it was acted like it was okay if you sat in with Red. So I had you know I had a telly with me, and so I just got up, and there were some extra amps and stuff for people to sit in. So I just ended up playing for a couple hours with Red Volkart, and it was quite the kick to the pants, you know, because every time you played a solo, you knew that you were gonna get your butt whipped by Red, but it was the it was the best thing ever, and I. I can vividly, you know, see him as he sm smiled and sometimes would wink at me as he would bend the neck on his telly and, and just make all sorts of wonderful sounds. So, yeah, really, really have an enjoyed Red's playing. He is kind of the, the torchbearer for uh, kind of clean you know, kind of older Telecaster sounds, sounds that have kind of been forgotten by many. And also, you know, when you see him play, you know, he's going to be doing songs by Lefty Frizzell and Ray Price and, of course, Merle Haggard and Wynn Stewart and Buck Owens. And it's just so nice to get to hear those classic, you know, country tunes performed at such a high level by, you know, a great singer and, and player. Uh, of course, more recently, uh, Red came up and uh, he did the uh, the True Tone Lounge with me. And that was a real honor. And uh, you know, he was only in town for a day and I went down to the hotel that he was staying at, picked him up. We did the interview in about two hours and then I drove him back and he had to get on to sound check. And it was just so much fun to get to hang out you know, with him some and get to, get to do an interview. And it was during the interview that he told me that he was going to be moving to Virginia, which is where he lives now. So, and, uh, and he is still performing. And uh, one of the reasons he moved was he kind of wanted to slow down because while he was Austin in Austin, he was playing six or seven nights a week, sometimes multiple shows a day. And he just found that he wanted to slow down. So he's still playing a fair amount, but he, but he has slowed down. He's out in Virginia. And uh, sometimes he'll go out and play shows on his own uh, locally at the Floyd County store. And they have an online presence and you can find performances of, uh, of Red playing there. Also, uh, he, he, you know, he tours you know, with a Western swing outfit and, uh, and they, they do shows, you know, all over the place. They've even gone as far as Dubai. And, uh, so that's, that's, that's really fun thing that he does. And that the band doesn't have a drummer and, and Red will play an arch top guitar. It's one of the few times where you'll see him without a Telecaster, but, uh, yeah, really enjoy and love Red Volkart. Um, let's gear wise, uh, Red has pretty much always played Telecasters. Uh, he, uh, 
he's had a number of black guards and white guard, you know, fifties white guards and even, you know, customs and things, you know, through the, you know, sixties tellies and such. Uh, but he's probably most associated with black guard tellies and he's been, you know, featured in you know, like Dave Hunter's Telecaster book, or he's been, you know, in the black guard book or the Pinecaster book. Uh, and that's, you know, he, he is one of the authorities on vintage Telecasters. He really knows all the little bits and parts, you know, because there's so many things, not everything has, you know, blatant markings on it. And some things you are not able to identify things like screws or maybe the shape of a, you know, chrome pickup cover or something like that. But he can because he's had so many old guitars and taken them apart or found old parts and restored them. And so that's uh, that's one of the reasons why I said he's, you know, one of the Telecaster's best friends. The other thing is I say he's the Telecaster player's best friend because he is such a kind and supportive person. You know, if you're, if you're a good guy, then Red is in your camp and Red is going to support you and say kind things and is going to help you. And he's just a great guy. And that is truly special. Uh, someone that is a great player and a great person. Let's see, let's talk about gear. You know, I, of course, you know, he's played all these early, you know, tellies, but, uh, Amp wise, you know, of course, for a long time, he used Fender amps, you know, with JBL D120s or K120 speakers. Uh, more recently, he's played Grammatico amps, and uh, John has made a number of amps for him that he's played. Also, uh, well, then there's also been like PV LTDs and some other, you know, kind of you know, interesting, you know, transistorized amps from the 60s and 70s that he's played, including some Showbud amps. And the most recent Showbud amp that he's been using is this little practice amp. So Showbud made this amp that had a 15 in it and they made kind of a, a smaller version that there were only a handful of them made and they were made for like Buddy Emmons and Lloyd Green and people of, of that ilk. And he has one of those and it's, it's lower powered and it has a 12 inch JBL D120 in it. And he had a friend of his back in Texas go through the amp and also put a digital reverb circuit in it. And that's an amp that you see him perform a lot with, um, you know, with, with trios and such where he doesn't need as much power. And, uh, and it's a, you know, of course, red makes everything sound great, but it's a great sounding little amp. And, uh, I've not been able to find another one like it cause I would, I would snatch it up if I could. Uh, strings, he's been, uh, for a long time, he used labellas uh, and as heavy as 12s or 13s. And then in the last couple of years, uh, partially to allow other people to sit in and play his guitar without complaining, he started using Ernie Ball 11s. Pick-wise, he's used, uh, you know, these, uh, oh, these fancy schmancy, uh, you know, picks. Let's see. Why am I blanking? Blue chips. So yes, I have one, one here. So he's been using blue chip picks and, uh, and those Ernie Ball strings. And, and he doesn't just use vintage Telecasters. He's a big supporter of, of uh, you know, of boutique builders. And so Asher and a number of other companies have built guitars for him. And many times when he travels, he doesn't take a vintage guitar. He'll take one of these uh, boutique built Telecasters, but usually he wants one with a big neck light ash body, brass saddles, and kind of a vintage style, you know, pickup setup. And he kind of likes the nickel silver cover on the neck pickup for a clearer sound. Yeah, I think that, uh, that covers the old, uh, gear thing. Uh, yeah, if you're, if you're into physical media, I recommend, you know, picking up Telewacker and uh, No Stranger to a Tele. Those are both really cool. Of course, you can also find those online. There are all sorts of uh, lessons that he's done for uh, for True Fire, and he's done older, you know, video lessons that you can find online, and they're very much worth uh, picking up. And uh, of course, if he's ever playing anywhere, you should absolutely go see him. So. Red Volkar, one of my favorite players, proud to say he's a, a friend. And of course he got me uh, using a JBL speaker. So, 
All right, now it's time for Zach's book time. Today, we're going to talk about one of my favorite biographies, or it's an autobiography, a memoir. It's One Train Later by Andy Summers. I picked up this book when it was released, um, not being a huge fan of the police. I mean, of course, I enjoy the police and have enjoyed you know, Andy's playing, but I, I really enjoyed his, uh, his writing. He's a, he's a great writer, and it's, this is a very enjoyable read. Whether you pick it up or check it out from the library, I highly recommend this. Uh, one of the things that you don't realize was that he was, uh, he was a bit older than the other two members of the police. And so he's more of a contemporary with guys like Eric Clapton and such. And he was you know, playing in bands in, in England in the 1960s. And in fact, he talks about how he sold his burst to, uh, to Eric Clapton after you know, you know, Eric's was, was stolen. And uh, yeah, so you get all these great stories. And again, it's just an enjoyable read. And I think, uh, you know, just on, on another front, I think Andy does not get enough uh, credit for how important he is as far as pop guitar playing. I think he's, you know, as important as Chuck Berry, you know, was to the 50s, I think Andy Summers was to the late 70s and 80s. I think so many people, you know, learned about using effects, using delay, um, chord voicings that were different, you know, more having more of a jazz influence. The, uh, the removing the third and adding those add nine chords and such. I think uh, Andy is an amazing player and he's a fantastic writer. And so uh, check out One Train Later by Andy Summers. All right, guys. Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's episode and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.